Hello and welcome to the Cecil Annual Lecture. I'm Andy Richards. Due to the pandemic, we'll be conducting this evening's event completely online and we're delighted to help continue the Centre for Critical International Laws tradition of bringing together leading figures in the field to share with us their cutting edge contributions. This year, we're joined by Dr. Gerardo Quinn and Dr. Yanis Kalpusos from the Global Legal Action Network. GLAN are a non-profit organisation challenging injustice through legal action and tackling everything from serious human rights violations to environmental harms across borders and communities. Before we hear from our guests, here's a short clip showcasing what GLAN do. And does. Now, if you have any questions for our panellists later, you can send them in via the live chat sidebars on whichever stream you're watching us on. We'll put those to our special guests later. Now, to introduce our GLAN guests this evening, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Louisa Slav and Dr. Emily Haslam from the Kent Law School for some opening remarks. Dr. Haslam, it's over to you. Thank you. And on behalf of the Centre for Critical International Law, I'd like to reiterate a very warm welcome to our 2021 annual lecture. And it's with great pleasure that I'm going to say a few words about CECIL to you, which together with my colleague, Dr. Luisa Slava, I've been co-directing this year. So CECIL, or the Centre for Critical International Law, is based in Kent Law School. It was established in 2008 with the aim of fostering a critical approach to the teaching and research of international law, international legal problems. Members of the Centre for Critical International Law are a diverse community of scholars. Cecil members are based both in Canterbury and in Brussels at the University of Kent's Brussels School of International Studies. Cecil members work in the field of international law, very broadly understood, and other areas of law that relate to and or impact upon global legal problems. Cecil is part of a global network of centres focused on bringing an international perspective to law, but it is simultaneously embedded in the critical approach to law teaching and research for which Kent Law School is renowned. And although they share a commitment to the critical study of law, Cecil scholars are methodologically diverse. For example, members study international law from the perspective of its histories, they engage in political theory and international relations. But if methodologically diverse, academic and student members of CECIL share a commitment to interrogating and challenging the power relations and political ideologies that run through, shape and are shaped by international laws. CECIL members think also about the creative possibilities within international law, as well as its limitations. Indeed, some CECIL members are also engaged in the practical application of international law in a number of different roles. And the achievement of a critical practice of international law is, of course, exemplified by the work of the Global Legal Action Network, or GLAN, about which we'll hear more tonight. Since its establishment, CECIL has offered an active programme of events. These have included workshops, films and guest talks. 
Cecil also seeks to engage through its distinctive social media presence. More recently, members of its vibrant postgraduate community have worked on developing an innovative uh, podcast, for example, Falls Utopia. And in 2015, Cecil introduced its annual lecture program. This has provided an opportunity to celebrate the work of innovative critical scholarship at the forefront of its field. Now, at the current moment, when critical interventions in international law are so vitally needed, we um, are delighted that GLAN, which exemplifies a critical approach to the practice of international law, is able to deliver the 2021 annual lecture. And I'm really pleased to hand over to my colleague and Cecil co-director, Dr. Luisa Slava, who will say more about the Global Legal Action Network. Thank you very much, Dr. Haslam. And now it's over to Dr. Slava. for that lovely introduction of the work that we do at the Center for Critical International Law. Um, it is my great pleasure tonight to introduce the organization and the presenters of this year's uh, annual lecture. Uh, this is the first time that the Center for Critical International Law celebrates with the annual lecture an organization rather than the work of a particular scholar in the field of international law. And we decided to do so because of the incredibly difficult moment that we are going through at this particular point in time. Global poverty, environmental collapse, an ongoing refugee crisis, a devastating pandemic, and the actions of reactionary governments across all regions are some of the many features of our present. In response to this, we thought it was our duty to call an attention to collective efforts that are advocating for the rights of the most vulnerable. We decided to also invite the Global Legal Action Network and Dr. Geroid O'Connor and Dr. Yanis Kolpusos to deliver this year's annual lecture because of the phenomenal achievements in the field of international public lawyery in recent years. GLAN and all the permanent staff and scholars and volunteers supporting the organization on an ongoing basis, on an ongoing basis are nothing less than an, an inspiration for a generation that had, has grown skeptical of law but who remain aware that legal action is still a fundamental part of the toolkit in the fight for global social justice. In preparing for this introduction, I contacted Itamar Mann, uh, a colleague and a friend of Geroid and Ianes and a collaborator of GLAN in some projects. Um, and Itamar put it neatly for me. The critical impulse is often to be a skeptical of public interest lawyering. It is felt that too often people appeal to law to change the world without sufficiently understanding law and its shortcomings in the first place. With this view, however, a division between thinking and action is reified, ignoring broader efforts in the, social, just in the social sciences and the humanities to recognize the value of praxis in our engagement with the world. For Itamar, and for many current international lawyers, scholars, activists, and for us at the Center for Critical International Law, GLAN has, a, has been able to successfully push against these uh, um, impetus to keep separate critical reflection and action. And with this, GLAN, since, establish, since its establishment in 2016, has uh, been able to advance alternative modes of legal advocacy and serve as a laboratory of progressive lawyering in context of war and occupation, corporate accountability, environmental and economic justice, and migration and border violence. Before I pass the floor to Glenn, I would like to introduce Geroid and Yanis, uh, who will speak on behalf of the, of, um, the organization tonight. Dr. Geroid O'Connor serves as a director of the Global Legal Action Network, where he serves as responsible for Glenn's legal actions and strategic growth. He's a visiting fellow at the Transnational Law Institute at King's College London and an adjunct lecturer at the Irish Centre for Human Rights, where he's responsible for, uh, for legal clinical work and where he also teaches transnational lawyering. He has worked directly with human rights groups in Palestine and Syria and provided legal support for numerous NGOs internationally. Dr. Ianis Kalpusis is a scholar and practitioner in public international law, international criminal law, the law of war, and human rights law. He's a faculty member at City Law School, University of London, 
a visiting assistant professor at Boston University <clears throat> School of Law, and a regular lecturer at Harvard Law School. He's co-founder of the Global Legal Action Network and has worked on the themes of war and occupation, environmental justice, co corporate accountability, and border violence. He has also worked with legal clinics at Stanford Law School, Harvard Law School, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and King's College London. Glenn, Geroy, Yanis, thank you for accepting our invitation and thank you for all the important work that you do. Thank you, uh, Luis, and uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to begin by, my name is Garota Quinn, and I'd like to begin by thanking Luis and Emily for the kind introduction and the invitation to deliver um, the annual lecture for the Kent Centre for Critical International Law. It is an honour to have this opportunity to share with you today uh, the work of my colleagues at the Global Legal Action Network. And we hope that by the end of this talk, along with my colleague, Yanis Kalpuzos, that you'll have a clearer understanding about the challenges faced when using law to tackle systemic injustice, as well as our attempts to use international law and other domains of law in an innovative manner. Um, and despite our big uh, name and ambition, we are a, a small but nimble organization, which began in 2016 as a, a voluntary endeavor, bringing together academics and practitioners. And in a relatively short period of time, we've taken well over 40 uh, international legal actions, tackling a wide number of issues involving at least 24 jurisdictions and territories. And in building this relatively unique practice, we've had no roadmap. Uh, we've very much learned through doing and reflecting. And we hope to share some of uh, our insights today. But let me first begin by providing you with an example. Uh, from a multi-year legal action led by uh, my colleague Valentina Azarova, which examines the role of international tourism and the international tourism industry in sustaining the economies of illegal Israeli settlements at the expense of Palestinians living under military occupation in occupied Palestinian territory. Um, and I'd just like to first show you an image um, from a PowerPoint slide that will accompany this talk. And once this appears, you'll see uh, a gentleman standing outside a uh, uh, what is an archaeological site. Um, his name is Essa Burkat. He's from the village of Nabi Samuel in the West Bank. Um, and he's looking into the land of his former village where he was evicted to make way for an archaeological park. Uh, he was subsequently moved along with his neighbors uh, to a site nearby, which has been uh, continuously um, suppressed with demolition orders. The village's designation as a national park has also subjected it to an unlawful planning regime where buildings, including simple structures, are prohibited. And the island, sorry, the, the village has become isolated by the infamous wall, leaving residents to face severe movement and access restriction due to their status as West Bank ID holders. I be first, and my colleagues first became aware of the existence of this village when it appeared in a brochure in a local travel shop. European and North American tourism companies regularly visit sites in Israeli settlements uh, in the occupied Palestinian territory and the occupied Syrian Golan in the north. Package holidays make up about a third of incoming tourists to Israel, a booming industry that brings about 5 million visitors in pre-pandemic times. And the vast majority of package tours include locations beyond Israel's internationally recognized borders, such as Jerusalem's old city, um, which you'll see in uh, an advert, if we could click forward once, uh, that appears behind the image of, um, maybe we go back, the animation didn't work. Um, but you, you'll see there's typical brochures demonstrating uh, East Jerusalem with its distinctive golden dome as being part of Israel. Um, we started analyzing uh, these sites because they entail some of the most serious violations of international humanitarian law and hum human rights law and have a severe humanitarian impact on the local population. We looked at the online marketing materials from roughly 100 tour operators operating across 10 jurisdictions over the course of the last two years. All take their customers to at least two settlement sites in the OPT without fail. And some also offer visits to sites located in the Syrian Golan. 
all investigative companies misrepresent uh, parts of their itineraries by portraying sites such as East Jerusalem and Bethlehem or the occupied Golan as being part of Israel. And we have published this research in a recent report with the Center for Research on Multinational Corporations, SOMO. Um, and this report reveals how the industry leaders, uh, the leading companies in the tourism sector, are systemically misleading uh, the nature of OPT sites uh, in, uh, and portraying them as being normal sites in Israel. Um, what happens in villages such as Nanmai Samuel is that uh, incoming tour operators and their tourists can move freely while Palestinians are confined to enclaves, their access to land is restricted, they lack access to natural resources and basic services. So real distinction. And so in, a, in a, an accompaniment to that report um, was the launching of a multi-jurisdictional um, set of consumer complaints, arguing that this misrepresentation uh, is uh, detrimental to consumers being able to make an informed decision about what they are purchasing. The reality has been hidden from them. And we hope to use consumer law to nudge the behavior of these companies and to um, spur regulators into action to uh, find that these are misleading advertisements and that the advertisements of settlements should be uh, prohibited and thus cutting off a, an extremely lucrative flow of revenue from these sites that constitute breaches of international law. Um, and we also are, are cognizant of developments at the European Union level, um, which in November uh, 2019, the Europe Court of Justice of the European Union said that, or found that in relation to origin information of produce originating from illegal settlements, that consumers have a right to know the, the nature of these um, types of products. And we argue that the same standard should now be extended to holiday, uh, holiday package tour itineraries. So you can see from this example that the injustice faced by local Palestinians, such as Isa uh, standing and looking over his former village lands is structural. It involves um, deep inequalities of power and the complicity of international uh, economic flows and supply chains. And at the root of many human, right, via, human rights violations, not just in Palestine, this deep inequality of power is a, a continuous feature. Existing political and economic legal structures often allow powerful states and corporate actors to act in ways that violate collective and individual rights and interests. And as international lawyers, um, we are aware that in the international legal system has itself been created in a way that benefits those powerful actors. And we would like to turn this on its head and use law for the powerless, um, and recognizing that some tower, sometimes um, power can create some space for the law to affect change. And we are seeking to expand this and realize this. And from land grabbing to forced labor, these violations are transnational, multi-sectoral, and perpetrated by a diversity of actors, such as private corporations, powerful individuals, governments, who exploit technology, economics, and international law itself with innovation and efficiency. And at the same time, multiple obstacles stand in the way of vulnerable communities who are impacted by human rights violations, who are seeking justice and accountability. And so we came together under the shared conviction that to have any hope of curbing these abuses and tackling these complex structures, that this would require an equally sophisticated and networked response, one that is innovative and creative. We sense that more could be done to challenge serious human rights violations by transcending borders and disciplines, not least the divide between practice and academia. And in this vein, we set out to work with communities and individuals to unlock the potential of foreign courts and legal mechanisms to secure strategic change. Um, and, and in building this transnational practice, we saw that there are many parallels and lessons to be learned from public interest litigation in the domestic sphere. Ultimately, all public litigation, public interest litigation, speaks to the tension between the individual's interest and the broader impact a concern for collective rather than individual justice. Thus, the remedies that we seek in public interest litigation usually do not flow directly from the rights that are violated because they are about seeking social and institutional change. And it's in this context that 
critical legal scholarship has warned of the individualizing effect of the human rights lens. As the uh, US historian Morton Horowitz said in the context of public interest litigation, it draws energy and imagination away from structural change, denying equal legitimacy to claims that the overall distribution of wealth and power is unjust. So not only are we dealing with a, a distance between individuals and the community, we should also be concerned about the distance between those doing the lawyering and the affected communities. The second distance is often articulated in terms of legitimacy, where lawyering risks becoming a physically detached enterprise and an elite exercise of power rather than an effort to empower the community, something that is usually compounded by a lack of resources and, and the fact that legal education and practice is predicated on an individual centric lawyer client module, which further diminishes the appetite for strategizing with the greater community in mind. Thus, with GLON, we set out to practice transnationally. Um, and the challenges of distance are even more acute when uh, operating in this on this plane, including the distance between rights and a limited set of remedies between the faraway lawyer and the affected community. And layered onto this is the critique of international law as being a structural component that perpetuates global inequalities. However, um, as similar to what Luis said in the introduction, we believe that existing critiques of human rights advocacy simply do not provide a sufficient guide for dealing with these concerns in practice. And in fact, they risk encouraging us to abandon the project in its entirety, thereby creating a third distance between critique and practice. Um, and instead, we have decided to chart a middle path forward, um, one that was minded of all these distances in order to build an impactful practice. Um, Secondly, I'd like to introduce, uh, uh, before handing over to Yanis, a, a second example from our work. Um, if you could also bring back the slides, please, in the next display, the next image. Um, here, we in the top left corner, um, this is an image uh, from Uzbekistan of a farmer called Shukarat Saparov, a 29-year-old Uzbek farmer who, um, in prior to the taking of this picture, tried to hang himself from his barn. Uh, the reason being that officials had confiscated his land for planting melons instead of cotton. Uzbek cotton accounts for about 4% of worldwide production. And at the time in, in 2018, when we were bringing, uh, looking at this issue in 2017, a brutal government-sponsored system of forced labor lay at the heart of the Uzbek textile industry, where teachers, doctors, and civil servants were forced into cotton fields each year to pick cotton. Um, and they had extremely onerous quotas to input, which were imposed often through the threat of extreme physical violence. We filed with the administrative courts in England and Wales um, a, a challenge seeking to uh, call into question EU trade measures, which applied to preferential trade tariffs, uh, which these cotton Uzbek, uh, Uzbek cotton products enjoyed. In other words, we were arguing that um, these products should not be incentivized and be given preferential trade terms where they pay lower duty. And instead, we should we these goods produced through forced labor much must, must be stopped by a customs authorities. So it was problematizing the, the uh, responsibility of customs authorities. And we filed a case at a time when the EU was negotiating an even more favorable deal with the Uzbek government, working closely with exile groups such as the Uzbek Forum based in Berlin. And this allowed us to maximize the impact of this legal work beyond the legal setting and to ensure that our communications were also effective in mobilizing other NGOs. And while this case was unsuccessful due to a, a, a technicality and a change in circumstances and reforms coming in, which is a welcome thing, uh, we continue to look at the trade of forced labor goods. And currently we are uh, paying close attention to uh, the, the situation of the Uyghurs in Western China where Chinese authorities have systematically detained over 1 million Uyghur Muslims since 2017, using a network of high security indoctrination and prison camps. And the mass incarceration of Uyghurs is the latest installment of uh, this Western China's history of forced prison labor. We were able to, working with our partners, uh, including uh, the, uh, the World Uyghur Congress submitted a, an extensive file of evidence to the UK customs authorities detailing allegations not only of prison and forced labour, 
um, but also uh, how this was linked, uh, intimately linked to the region's cotton industry, which accounts for 84% of the cotton produced by China. And we dusted off um, a 19th century law known as the Foreign Prison Maids Goods Act of 1897 to argue that um, goods produced in foreign prisons um, should be prohibited and suggested that the importation of cotton from Xinjiang province in China might put authorities at risk of falling foul of uh, criminal legislation also, notably the Proceeds of Crime Act and the Serious Crimes Act. Um, we are currently working extensively with uh, other partners now to build a consolidated evidence base for further litigation, laying the conditions for impactful legal work. Um, in doing so, we commissioned a legal opinion, um, which, uh, which was commissioned by with Essex Court Chambers, um, looking into whether or not the um, situation in Xinjiang province amounted to crimes against humanity or further still genocide. And this independent opinion delivered by Essex Court Chambers found that there was a credible case that China was committing genocide. And you'll see on the, the right hand side, an image, a drone image from the transfer of Uyghurs en masse um, in Xinjiang province to centers where they are often forced into labor, um, sexual servitude and other uh, very serious violations. Uh, in response, China imposed sanctions on Essex Court Chambers for producing this opinion. And uh, nonetheless, it did form an influential part in the debate for um, uh, the UK Parliament in April of this year to vote unanimously to declare that China is committing genocide against the Uyghurs. Um, and our opinion was extensively referenced in this. So we, we aim to combine both these types of groundbreaking opinions with evidence to, again, diversify our work in this field. So hopefully those two examples give you a good insight into how we operate and how we tackle quite serious and pressing issues. Next, I'll, I'll be handing over to my colleague, Yanis Kalpuzos, and he will begin by speaking about our climate change litigation case. Um, we work on a diversity of, of issues, as you'll continue to see throughout this presentation, but we did feel that unless we were tackling climate change, um, everything else was less relevant, given the overwhelming threat that climate change poses to the enjoyment of human rights internationally. So I will um, wrap up my part of the talk and uh, we will now share with you a, a, a short video um, that highlights our landmark case on climate change, the first time that climate change has been brought before the European Court of Human Rights, where we are suing 33 countries. So I'll leave you with that video now. Thanks very much. Most of us agree that we need to act. We feel the urgency. I mean, the evidence is overwhelming. Look at the droughts, the floods, the fires. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Jens Kalpuzos and it is indeed an honor to be invited to uh, give part of the CESOL uh, annual talk. Uh, 
and it is an honor for the organization GLAN to be celebrated, to use the term of uh, Luis, uh, in this particular manner. So we just watched a video uh, related to our uh, submission to the European Court of Human Rights, uh, rights on uh, against 33 states on the question of climate change, trying to use a human rights law angle uh, to address the uh, violations of states' obligations according to the climate change regime. Uh, that case is uh, effectively trying to do three things. We want to articulate the real harm caused to real people, uh, our clients. Uh, we want to uh, express and highlight the shared and individual responsibility of the major polluting states. Uh, and we want to find the best way for the international and the domestic uh, parts of the international legal system to work together to address the issue. Now, this may sound uh, more or less straightforward, but it is not because both the climate change legal regime and to some extent the international human rights law regime have been created in a way that obscures both harm and responsibility, uh, and which makes it harder to address the real issues posed by climate change. Indeed, the default position is that almost everyone is responsible and almost everyone or everyone is affected. And behind that default position, both the problem itself and the structural inequalities that are associated with the problem persist. Um, so we are trying to address that with specific parts, if you will, of our legal argumentation. Uh, and we can have the first uh, slide up uh, that shows the structure of that argument that I want to share with you. So firstly, uh, we want to um, see and we want to express and want to show the real harm in terms of uh, rights affected. Um, it is actually not this slide. It is uh, there we go. Uh, the actual rights that are being affected, uh, which is in our argument, the right to life and the right to private life. And interestingly, the European Court of Human Rights, when it communicated the case to the states, added the question, a question related to uh, inhuman and degrading treatment. Uh, and these are real rights that are causally affected, clearly affected uh, in the future, uh, not conjecturally, uh, and that belong to specific individuals. And therefore, that there are indeed real victims and our claimants are real victims whose rights are being affected in this instance. And that this is not a broad and vague Actio popularis, it is about an issue that affects all of us, for sure, and it is about an issue that touches on social structures, but it is also very specifically affecting the rights of real uh, individuals in this instance. And it is, of course, a matter of great urgency. Uh, and this is the other aspect that we aim to highlight with our argumentation and that we asked specifically the court to recognize. And indeed, the court has uh, recognized the urgency of the question and uh, is treating uh, the communication accordingly. And on the flip side, and here is one of the most complex aspects uh, of the legal regimes on, of this argumentation, is the question of responsibility. And indeed, international law is created, uh, and international human rights law and climate change law is created in a manner that uh, prima facie is very hard to identify the responsibility of individual states for the harm and the consequences of their polluting actions. And we are arguing, using a theory of shared responsibility under international law, that to the extent that states uh, and specific polluting states, according to scientific evidence, are contributing to the indivisible harm, uh, then their responsibility is both shared and individual, and importantly, it is presumed. And the court needs to find that and, as it were, uh, refer the matter back to states in order to uh, counter that and do something about this. And in the process of identifying the presumed and shared responsibility of the 33 states, 
We argue that ambiguities in terms of the sharing aspect and the contribution to the responsibility should not benefit the polluters, should not benefit the powerful states, but should benefit uh, our clients, should benefit the victims. And also what is related that a um, concept that exists in uh, human rights law and especially in the European human rights system, the margin of appreciation, whereby uh, the court defers to states and to domestic authorities in terms of balancing particular interests, should be interpreted narrowly in this instance, despite sometimes the European Court of Human Rights in environmental issues accepting a uh, wide uh, appreciation. Uh, and that uh, is the articulation of the reality of the harm and the reality of the responsibility. And then what remains is the question of how is this best to be addressed using legal tools, using uh, legal um, uh, institutions. And we are trying to articulate and address a combination of the domestic and the international that would contribute in this instance. Uh, we are trying to address uh, the European Court of Human Rights, the regional level, uh, not in order to ignore domestic courts and domestic institutions, but in order to empower them uh, following a decision of the European Court of Human Rights, which we'll hope will further empower and boost the beginning uh, of the important uh, set of jurisprudence that has developed already at the level of domestic courts. And our arguments around jurisdiction and around um, the exhaustion of domestic remedies follow that uh, line of thinking. I'm not going to go into detail because they're quite technical, but let's just say that in terms of exhausting domestic remedies, we're arguing that um, there is no, uh, there are no resources and there is no time to go uh, door to door to the 33 domestic um, sets of jurisdictions before addressing a matter that is uh, fundamentally within the espace juridique of the European Court of Human Rights, a, a, a regional issue. And this uh, is um, this approach is reflecting the goal of the organization as a whole. Um, and we can uh, put down the slide uh, now. Uh, it's, 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 it's reflecting the goal of the organization as a whole, which is to use uh, their technical tools of the international legal system and their expertise in a way that illuminates what the legal regime, or indeed the way that the legal regime is practiced, often obscures and to begin addressing injustice that is structural, as Gerard said, and that is based on the inequality of the international system. While keeping in mind that law is, uh, indeed, to some extent, uh, always is uh, part of the problem of structural inequality and injustice. In short, it is about the way that we try to engage international law critically. If we may see the following slide, uh, this uh, starts from an understanding that both the rules uh, and the structures of the international legal system, both historically, but also at present, benefit the most powerful actors, uh, but also then, as Garod said, to investigate exactly how some rules and some concepts and some institutional and jurisdictional avenues may nevertheless be useful in both highlighting and maybe even begin to challenge some of the structural injustices of the international legal system alongside political strategies, alongside non-legal uh, forms of advocacy. And in that context, uh, understand exactly what level of uh, the legal and the political uh, can be um, combined in order to achieve the ideal um, result. Ideal being a misnomer most of the times, as is sometimes uh, the use of the concept of strategy. So we do transnational and international strategic litigation, but we are very keen on uh, saying to ourselves as well as to others that the concept of strategy in this uh, context needs to be engaged with modesty and without any pretension that we know exactly the causal effect of the mix of legal and political advocacy in these complex and transnational matters. But this is the way that we aim to engage specific 
um, doctrinal and conceptual and institutional aspects of the international legal regime. Let me give you one more example, and let's move to the, the next slide. And this is uh, an example from the area of migration, uh, but it is an instance where um, to address the issues associated with migration and specifically the violence against migrants, we are not using uh, human rights law as we do in other legal actions or uh, refugee and migration law, but we're using international criminal law, which is a regime that is not usually associated with these particular uh, practices. Indeed, international criminal law and the way that it is practiced, at least by most uh, relevant institutions, both domestically and internationally, tends to focus on what we have called uh, spectacular uh, violence. Uh, and if any association between criminalization and migration is usually in terms of criminalizing migrants or criminalizing those who um, uh, help migrants or using concepts of international criminal law in order to exclude asylum seekers or indeed try asylum seekers once they have become refugees domestically. And here, drawing from uh, work associated with uh, Greece, uh, that uh, research that I uh, conducted with my uh, colleague uh, Atlan uh, Itamar Mann, uh, we developed an action focusing on Australia and its uh, sophisticated, if particularly brutal, practice of offshore and outsourced detention in Manus Island and Nauru. And we worked with the Stanford uh, International Human Rights Law and Conflict Resolution Clinic um, and a number of academic experts on international criminal law and international refugee law uh, to develop, analyze and submit a communication to the International Criminal Court arguing that Australia's regime is classified and can be classified as uh, falling under the category of crimes against humanity, which includes uh, specific prohibited acts, including unlawful imprisonment, unlawful deportation, inhumane acts, and so on, uh, as part of an overall attack against the civilian population. The, uh, and the, the, the goal was, again, to engage the uh, categories and make specific uh, legal claims, but also to uh, challenge the international criminal law regime and to try to use it in articulating the degree of the harm that is being caused. Specifically in this instance, also engaging the concept of gravity, uh, which is a term for the admissibility of cases at the International Criminal Court, and um, argue that uh, this uh, type of violence, both because of uh, it's, you know, the effect of people that it affect, that it affects, sorry, the number of people that it affects, the way that it is exercised, but also because it is becoming increasingly normalized as more and more states in the global north uh, adopt similar practices of outsourced uh, detention and other forms of violence is all the more grave. Uh, and I think we can uh, put down the slide now. And it took the International Criminal Court about uh, three years to consider that. It responded in a way that uh, accepted some of our arguments about unlawful imprisonment, um, unlawful imprisonment in the context of the Rome Statute and international criminal law, but uh, tried to separate that finding from the overall policy of uh, Australia in this instance in a way that unfortunately confirmed um, some critical understandings of international criminal law uh, that wants it only to focus on particular types of violence perpetrated by particular individuals and uh, collectivities in only particular parts of the world. Um, although we do think that our analysis and our advocacy and our submission did have some influence in the conversation, crucial thinkers um, and uh, actors in this area, like the UN Special Rapporteur for Extrajudicial Killings at the time, Agnes Calamar, uh, incorporated international criminal law analysis in reports on the deaths of migrants. Um, and indeed, the challenge uh, was to see to what extent these arguments around international criminal law could uh, help in this direction. International criminal law being a legal regime, which many of us are skeptical to what extent it can be a significant part of uh, truly progressive politics. Uh, and it is engaged, as Garod said, having in mind the extent to which law and international law is 
uh, part of the problem. So these two examples, I hope, gave you a good impression about the way in which we use uh, doctrine, tools, institutions, but also to some extent a network uh, of collaborations uh, in, uh, you know, together with local organizations. Uh, in Australia, we worked with a local NGO called GetUp, for example, uh, and, uh, and other academics and other practitioners in order to advance specific critical interventions. And um, if we can have the final uh, slide with the four themes, through that practice and through these cases, uh, we have developed a focus on four specific themes that Luis also mentioned uh, in his introduction, war and occupation, environmental and economic justice, accountability and supply chains, migration and border violence. All four themes touch on ways in which global inequality manifests itself and ways in which international law can be part of the problem, but also could maybe be engaged in a manner that highlights and at least aims to address or remedy uh, some of these questions of structural injustice. In Grode's talk, in my talk, and in the testimonials that you will hear uh, following my contribution, you will hear about other examples uh, associated with these themes, and we'll be very happy also to touch on different cases and different approaches to these themes in the Q&A. So thank you very much uh, for me. Hi everyone, I'm Yvonne McDermott Rees. I'm a professor of law at Swansea University and I'm also a member of GLAN's Legal Action Committee. Um, I've been asked to say a few words to you today about GLAN's work on open source information and its use in accountability processes for human rights violations. <clears throat> so, by way of introduction, Open source information is basically information that anyone can access, and it has become increasingly important in the digital context where people, be they survivors, witnesses, uh, or perpetrators themselves, post evidence of violations online, often to social media. And we're still figuring out best practices for the preservation and use of this kind of evidence and the extent to which it can be used in court. For GLAN's work on accountability for breaches of international law in Yemen, this kind of information has particular importance. Together with amazing collaborators from organizations both in Yemen and around the world, GLAN has been working to preserve and verify open source information. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about two facets of this work, the Yemen Airstrike Evidence Database and the Open Source Investigations Project with Bellingcat. So on the first of those, uh, we work closely with partners to develop a database of airstrikes carried out by the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. One of our collaborators, Reframe, developed computer vision algorithms for the automatic detection and categorization of videos and pictures that contain indicators of illegal cluster munitions, which is really groundbreaking technology. The user-friendly database brings together key technologies to allow online user-generated content and private evidence to be stored and viewed together. The database enables the cross-referencing of large quantities of evidence and is available to trusted organizations seeking to promote accountability for violations of international law in Yemen. Issues surrounding the admissibility and weight of digital open source information have not yet been fully tested in the courts of England and Wales. And to that end, we organised in collaboration with Bellingcat a hearing to explore the admissibility of a piece of online open source evidence in a mock criminal trial. The hearing concerned the admissibility into evidence of a real video depicting an airstrike in Yemen in a fictional trial, with legal arguments put forward by Prosecution and Defence Counsel, two QCs and two junior barristers, witnesses and expert evidence, which was subject to cross-examination, and a final judicial determination by a sitting judge. We saw this as a brilliant way to test the methodology that Glan and Bellingcat had developed for online open source investigations in the Yemen project, and to see what kind of challenges lawyers might raise to it in a real life case. The full recording of both the mock admissibility hearing 
and Judge Joanna Corner's ruling are both available on YouTube. And I'd strongly encourage anyone who has an interest in this to take a look because it's really fascinating to see how the cross-examination unfolded. With these projects, GLAN is breaking new ground in showing how open source information can be used for accountability, in developing best practices that can be adopted by other human rights organizations, and in empowering others to consider the role of open source information in accountability processes. For my part, it's an honor to play a very small role in this important work. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Violetta moreno lax Reader in Law at Queen Mary University of London and GLAN Legal Advisor since 2018 on the Migration and Border Violence Stream. My work here has focused on what happens at sea and especially on the instrumentalization of the maritime environment by EU member states who use it to deny their human rights obligations. The refugee crisis has brought into sharp relief the difficulties facing asylum seekers in reaching safety across the Mediterranean. Over 20,000 cross-border deaths have been recorded since 2015 and the legal structure of border controls that GLAN denounces contributes crucially to this outcome. At GLAN, I have contributed to several complaints, but SS and Others versus Italy is the most significant. I'm very proud to lead the legal team and to have drafted our observations to the Strasbourg Court. The facts relate to an incident that occurred in November 2017 when the Libyan Coast Guard violently interfered with the efforts of the NGO vessel Sea-Watch 3 to rescue 130 migrants from a sinking dinghy. At least 20 of them died. The intervention was coordinated from Rome by the Italian Maritime Rescue Coordination Centre. Our submission challenges the legality of this practice, whereby Italy calls on the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept boat migrants and return them to Libya, where they face horrific conditions. The core argument is that such a mechanism of contactless control, a term that I coined in my academic research, relying on a third party that acts as a proxy, cannot be used by states to evade their human rights responsibility. Apart from its paradigm-shifting potential regarding our understanding of jurisdiction and the reach of state obligations in extraterritorial scenarios, this case is representative of GLAN's innovative approach to strategic litigation. The case is the result of a cooperative effort between GLAN, in partnership with the Italian Association for Juridical Studies in Migration, ASGI, which received support from Yale Law School's International Human Rights Clinic and the Migration Law Clinic of the University of Louvain-la-Neuve for the legal part of the work. This admission makes use of first-hand evidence provided by Sea-Watch and compiled by Forensic Oceanography, who produced a detailed reconstruction of the incident and the policies that gave rise to it. Further materials were collected through the SAROP-MED project, the Search and Rescue Observatory for the Mediterranean, which is an international multidisciplinary consortium of independent researchers and civil society organizations, including many of the search and rescue NGOs emerged since the refugee crisis. We followed what we've called a collaborative research in action approach, whereby Sea-Watch provided the raw material, then forensic oceanography analyzed it and systematized it, contextualizing it with further information collected from open sources. This all was then digested by the legal team in our application to the Strasbourg Court. In this way, we managed to channel the knowledge and expertise of several civil society organizations and academic researchers into our strategic litigation efforts as the best way to serve the applicant's interest and contest the wider policy on which the violations that they have suffered are based. This research in action methodology is what I find the most valuable in GLAN's approach to lawyering, and I'm very pleased to be able to contribute to it. Thank you very much for your attention and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you there to Dr. Valentina Azarova and Professor Eva McDermott-Reese for sending those testimonials in. Now, time to answer your questions from YouTube and Facebook with Dr. O'Quinn and Dr. Kalapoutas here on the line. Um, we've had uh, people watching all over the world. Someone has been watching from Indiana, USA and other places around the UK. Uh, we've had a comment in from Suyu saying uh, thank you for what you've done for Ouijuals and uh, everyone watching is, has been incredibly engaged with the fascinating work that uh, you've been telling us about. Um, 
But just now, tell us a little bit more about the structure of the organisation. To what extent uh, are you a network of independent professionals, academics, practitioners? Uh, and to what extent are you a centralised organisation? And that's to, should we go to Dr. Quinn? Sure, yes. Yeah. Um, we, I, I mean, from, from the outset, we knew that to take on a sophisticated network of harm required us to like, almost mirror um, that situation. And we worked the name, our network into our, our very name and our essence. Um, how we've concentrated on uh, and dealing with the, the growth of GLON uh, has been sort of through a, a distributed model. Um, and our exec team is supported by a, a select group of experts known as the Legal Action Committee. And they provide, um, uh, you know, contacts, expertise, advice across all of our legal actions. And we recruit on, in accordance with our needs. So that opens up um, enormous scope for um, boosting our capacity as well, because many of these are located in practice and academia. And likewise, we have uh, our executive team is plugged into um, and supported by a, a series of law schools, including uh, the Irish Centre for Human Rights, uh, Harvard, um, Boston University, the Law School in Boston, um, the University of Amsterdam, that uh, provides us with our executive team and meaningful work for the students who are involved. And we, we also have a, an advisory board um, with the uh, the sort of uh, well-established figures who uh, support our work and provide occasional support and direction. And our board of trustees, not necessarily rooted in practice, but very much experts in running an effective organization. Um, so between all of these uh, various branches of, of GLAN, um, we've managed to um, not let structure get in the way of our slightly experimental approach to um, doing law and uh, ensuring that uh, the executive team are supported but also have significant amount of autonomy and can consult with this community of practice and uh, we've tried to remain uh, sort of agile and nimble in that regard so that we don't fall into the usual pitfalls of organizations that grow too fast and um, become overly structural. Janice, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. Yeah, I uh, second everything you said. Uh, I would, yeah, I would add that to some extent in, uh, in trying to maintain an approach that we have called critical, uh, we want to keep learning from the expertise of individuals, whether they are academics or whether they are practitioners or whether they are investigators who work separately, right, and have their own uh, professional uh, trajectories, uh, learning processes, and so on and so forth. And it is always a, I think there is always a, a tension Um between these two notions, as as the question very well put it, between um, uh, you know the network element and the centralization, and it is a question between a professionalism and a uh, a mentality that wants to uh, uh, experiment and uh, develop thinking uh, in an open way, uh, and we don't always maybe strike exactly the right balance, but this is the the dialogue that we're engaged in. And in that structure, um, we saw there about volunteers and interns. It must be absolutely a amazing experience for, for these people to be involved with the organisation. There'll be students watching this lecture from the University of Kent and from other institutions all over the world. What kind of experience can, that, can it bring to work with organisations like GLAN to, to start a, a fledging career in international law? Who wants to take that one? I, I'm, I'm happy to start... So, sorry. Yeah, you go, Yanis, you go ahead. Yeah. I'm happy to start speaking a little bit to the, also the question of, uh, following from your question, but also some of the the, the, the references to the testimonials and, uh, and the presentation in terms of also the using of clinical education, right? Uh, so our, our goal is very much to uh, engage uh, 
students and engage uh, early uh, career researchers uh, in the development of the ideas and in the research associated with the cases. And uh, we both, Gerard and myself, uh, talked about the you know the the lines between doctrinal legal work on the other hand and critical social legal work and Luis mentioned that in his introduction as well and the 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 problems in creating these types of divisions between thinking and practice and so on and so forth and there is also a division between academic legal education and clinical legal education uh, and we are very keen in identifying and developing a practice of clinical education that breaks down these barriers, right? And that um, really uh, uses uh, the most uh, sophisticated and advanced aspect of um, doctrinal legal work and education uh, in that direction. And that also, to go perhaps more directly to your question, helps uh, individuals in finding their way in the quite chaotic um, you know, terrain of uh, transnational and international legal work and NGO work and human rights in the broader sense work uh, in a way that both you know, gives them an understanding of the actual uh, legal and practical questions, but also orients them critically in a professional way as well. And a little bit um, about funding now. Obviously, it's in incredibly um, important uh, for you. Do you ever have you ever felt influenced in a particular direction by funders? Um, I can categorically say no. Um, I think we attract a, a certain type of funder who is uh, not afraid of uh, shaking things up and uh, taking on quite powerful entities and actors. So we end up with a, a cohort of quite committed funders who um, work with us um, and, and shepherd us in some respects uh, um, amongst their community. Um, and, and secondly, we're also starting to prioritize um, uh, crowdfunding and digital fundraising to really diversify and uh, nurture our own independence so that we can uh, really uh, behave in a fully autonomous way. And, and our climate change case um, was launched and is being sustained through uh, crowdfunding. Well, thank you very much indeed. We've absolutely flown through that hour. It's been a, a fascinating uh, listen uh, and thank you ever so much. And that's just about all the time we've got uh, for now for this year's Centre for Critical International Law Lecture. My thanks to Dr. O'Quinn and Dr. Kalapusas from GLAN, Dr. Slava and Dr. Hassan from Kent Law School. And a big thanks to you at home uh, for sending your questions in and watching. If you want to find out more about GLAN, go to www.glanlaw.org or follow GLAN underscore law on social media. That's all from me. Thanks for watching and we look forward to seeing you hopefully in person at next year's Cecil Lecture. Goodbye.